ecosystems in the world. In South Africa, water abstraction, alternation of riverine ecosystems through dam building, interbasin water transfer, introduction of alien aquatic organisms and organic and industrial pollution have left few freshwater ecosystems in a natural state. Because of their size and interesting behavior, dragonflies and damselflies are considered to be the most charismatic of all aquatic insects. Oh, that's amazing. And let's learn in detail. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another interesting session of National Symposium on Conservation of Ordinates, jointly organized by the Department of Zoology of St. Joseph College for Women, Alapura, and the Department of Zoology of Velalar College for Women, E-Road, under Office of Academic Collaboration in association with the Society for Ordinate Studies. Kerala State Biodiversity Board and DBT Star College Scheme, Government of India. With much pleasure, let me invite Ms. Febi Paiwa, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, St. Joseph College for Women, Alapura, for the welcome address. Thank you, Armina. A warm good afternoon to one and all. Respected Chief Guest and the Speaker of the Day, Dr. Sujit V. Gopalan. Distinguished delegates, scholars, and dear friends, a hearty welcome to the fourth day of the National Symposium. It is a glorious moment to extend my warm wishes on behalf of the organizing committee of the National Symposium, Conservation of Odonator, to each one of you who have joined us in this session. Before I begin, let me take the opportunity to express my gratitude to all the organizing committee members of both the colleges and SOS for organizing such a fruitful program since last three days. Now, coming back to my assigned duty, first and foremost, I would like to welcome the principals of both the colleges for the session. Today, we are honored to have with us an eminent personality, a good orator, expert consultant and conservation biologist from the Society of Ordinate Studies, Dr. Sujit V. Gopalan. Dr. Sujit V. Gopalan have a profile which every biologist aspired to have. He was a senior research fellow at Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology in 2008-2014 period. He also has served as research associate at Kerala State Biodiversity Board uh, during 2015-17 period. He completed his PhD from the Department of Zoology, University College, Trivandrum in 2020. His research contributions include 18 scientific publications, three book chapters in reputed journals, in national and international. He has loved best paper awards and national and international grants in his includes the research of Finland. He is a well-known conservation biologist, consultant for various NGOs and government departments like KSBD, Trivandrum Museum and Zoo, Department of Forest for Faunal Diversity. He has also served in the capacity of many roles like expert consultant of WWF India, conservation biologist at SOS, team leader of WWF, and coordinator for various uh, surveys related to butterflies and odonates. Sir, welcome to the session. Now, I welcome all the faculty members of the zoology department of both the colleges and all the members of SOS to the symposium. Last but not the least, I also welcome all the participants without whom no program is successful. Welcome to one and all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Would you, you so much. You know? It is the most awaited moment for all of us to have a wider view on ordinates. I cordially invite Dr. Sujit V. Gopalan, expert consultant and conservation biologist, Society for Ordinate Studies, for today's session based on the topic, Ordinates for Monitoring Ecosystem Health. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Amina, and thank you, Fabi, for such a wonderful introduction. I uh, hope uh, last few days were very fruitful for you because uh, we started with a beautiful introduction to ordinate by Mr. Uh, Balachandran sir and followed by a session from uh, Pankaj about how climate change induces changes in ordinate diversity and 
you see you saw a lot of the uh, rain shifts and all lot of things happening after climate change so you have an idea that it is a very sensitive indicator for ecosystem hope i'm audible and my sound is enough for you to clear, clear enough okay could i hello hello yes sir you are audible yeah okay fine fine thank you yeah. so you are already know that they are very sensitive indicators and one of the finest faunal groups to study any changes in the ecosystem so you already have that idea but uh, when what we feel uh, is that uh, you need little more idea of on because when we come to conservation uh, you know that all of these things ultimately should lead to conservation of that species and the ecosystem so when it comes to that point uh, there is lot of things that to be learned how to, how do you take all these knowledges to conserve the species so it's a different scenario it's a practical approach of conservation so i am trying to with this uh, small session i am trying to give you an introduction how uh, partly how sos did some conservation efforts in ordinate partly how conservation of ordinate has been done properly because you know we we'll say it is a biological indicator it is a in food chain it is in food web but we don't know how 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 to take this information for an action plan to conserve ordinate so i'll try to go into it and try to impart some light into how to take a faunal group to conservation and how to utilize them to identify ecosystem health. and that that will be my goal actually so i'm trying to share my slides and let me know if you see my window okay do you see it yes sir okay thank you so we will go for me so i'm just going to talk on ordinates for monitoring ecosystem health so it's basically on how the faunal population of small this charismatic insects can be used to conserve conserve the ecosystem they live in because in an ecosystem it's not only the ordinates it's the predator prey and all of the food chain and food web so how do you do that so basically one should know why should we conserve an ordinate that is the first question when it comes to mind because i have heard this question lot many times we are spending crores of rupees on conserving tigers why do you want to conserve tigers we ask uh, if you go to there is uh, we have a uh, bordering area from uh, tamil nadu and karnataka actually it comes in kerala part only for Mar marayur this uh, this particular land has natural vegetations of sandalwood we spend lakhs and lakhs of amounts to protect the sandalwood it's a small patch of sandalwood some 1 1 2 3 3 kilometers i think 3 3 3 and a half square kilometers and stretch actually a proper population of sandalwood we spend a lot of money to conserve that small trees of sandalwood a lot of trees and it is you keep a man within some uh, 100 meters 100 meters you are man placed in each 100 meters and they patrol over day and night to conserve the sandalwood why do you do that why do you spend such a amount of money to conserve a population of ordinates and all so that is uh, one of the prime question uh, when it god i'm question so why should we conserve ordinates and this is what actually
the amount of mosquito repellents you used, uh, the amount of uh, uh, or the amount you spend for purchasing a mosquito net, the amount you spend, uh, spend for putting nets over your doors and windows. These all amount if you calculate, that is the amount of service and coordinates is giving to you when it comes to, and that, that amount is called as the amount for ecosystem services and automates offered to the human or human community actually. So now you know there are some reasons for conserving ordinates. They have equal value in food chain of food web as human beings. So we have, they have as, e as equal right to live in this world as we do. So now we know they have to be conserved. So how do we conserve that? Do you ever, have you ever thought of how do you conserve an ordinate? How do you conserve, you know, to order, conserve an ordinate, you have to conserve the ecosystem they live in. That is a prime thing you understand, right? So first thing to, uh, to conserve an organism, you should have a good idea of what the organism is. How many species are living around you? On the ecosystem you visualize, how many species live in this ecosystem? In this ecosystem, what are the habitats the species uses? And what is the ecological things that is being going on in this particular ecosystem? That is, what, what is the food chain and food web? this particular ordinate belongs to that particular ecosystem. So you need to have a good idea, very good idea of how many species are there in a particular ecosystem, what are the habitats of the microhabitat the ecosystem of the ecosystem that the species, the particular ordinates use, and what is the ecological uh, role this particular ordinates plays in that particular ecosystem. What are types of food chain and food web that this particular organism is being part of? When you have a good idea of this, you can make a steady design. You need to study this properly. To conserve an organism, the first thing you need to do is that you need to properly study this. Properly study. You need you just, you should, it is incomplete when you say that, okay, this is the ecosystem you want to conserve. You know, there is 10 species of ordination in this ecosystem. It's never complete. You need to know, you need to have a study where you measure quantitatively what all roles this ordinates plays in that ecosystem so that you can compare it over the time. So that is important that you design a well-designed study should be designed to generate data on this ordinates and the ecosystem they use it. And this should be properly a systematic data and it should be done in a systematic manner. If you are trying, if you're doing the study in, in a week, first week of a month, the next week of, the, I mean, the, the next next month also the first week should be just doing the same study on the same level. So it should be done systematically, it's called systematic monitoring because the time interval the duration used for the study, the type of uh, parameters you select for the study, always these should be constant over the time. And it's prop, uh, ideally it should be done by a same level of expertise. Because if you change the level of expertise, there will be a lot of errors also. And this, when you do such a study, you get generate a lot of data. And with this data, you can infer what are the changes going on in this ecosystem. And if you, when you understand what are the changes it is going on in the ecosystem, you can make an action plan to conserve or rejuvenate that ecosystem back to its normal state. And that is how a conservation is done. So this is basically how to conserve a particular faunal group. You need to go through these much procedures. You cannot interfere into an ecosystem without proper studies. Already. You would require basically very, very systematic studies and very systematic data to interfere into an ecosystem. You cannot just go down and say, yeah, we are going to tile the entire round of a pond. Around the pond, you are going to tile it this is not conservation because that is going to affect the ecosystem. So any interference into the ecosystem should be based on a proper study and then only you can make an action plan for conservation. So this is how to conserve them. So we are going to that. How do, what are the properties you could, when you come to ordinate to take up? So one of the thing is that they are an indicator of water quality. You know, you understand, I think you understand what you call it as a biological indicator or ecosystem indicator or just a bio indicator. It's all things that they indicate the health of an ecosystem they live in. So these are two species which, which are actually depending upon the water quality. This is called as torrent dart, called as Yukia fraseri. Malabar torrent dart is called as found in uh, some low altitude streams to 400 to 600 meters and all so that range. But when it comes to the water quality, they are found in one of the purest water forms on earth. When the water is getting contaminated, the population of the species come down. When it is good quality of water user, its population comes back to the stable range. So, but that entirely depends upon pure water for breeding and forage. All its uh, adult forms and larval forms are found in pure water, pure water from the forest trees. And this another species called as Brachythemis contaminata. We call it as dish jewel, as if its name suggests. 
it is tolerant to contaminated water or polluted water so when there is a water pollution this species can tolerate and when this species can tolerate water pollution its number grows up so whenever you should find large number of brachytherm is contaminated in a particular area you should understand that the water is bit contaminated other dragon flies cannot survive in this water so there is no actual competition for this dragon fly with other dragon flies so their number can rise up so that's why the number of drag, uh, brachytherm is contaminated is high here and you should infer that quality of water here is not good it is contaminated so these two indicators are of water quality so this is one of the condition they can indicate water quality second one they are indicators of certain habitats when you come when you see this dragon fly in malayalam i be be very beautiful malayalam name is there called as meghavarna and otherwise english its name is called as meghavarna because it has the colors of the sky and clouds and you know on it that is called as meghavarna but when it comes to its uh, 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 english common name it is called as meristica sapphire because it is found in meristica habitat one of the pristine habitats on earth the meristica swamps so it is found in meristica swamp scientific name is caliosypha light lily it is found in actually meristica swamp and at hence it is an indicator for this meristica swamp ecosystem so it is not just one ecosystem a dragonfly is going going to for it is actually the micro habitats of particular ecosystem when it comes to a pond or lake you can find multiple dragonflies in this particular ecosystem and each of the dragonflies occupies very particular micro habitats on this habitat on this particular habitat so this is pond and lake it is a habitat and there are a lot of micro habitats in this ponds and lakes like if you see this dragonfly it is called anax in, uh, indicus actually this uh, this dragonfly forages over the water surface and it will, you can find it going round and round over this water surface fast flying dragonfly actually and they capture the smaller insects on this uh, and smaller insects that emerges from the water and also the insects on the top flying around this over the surface of water so its area micro habitat condition is over the areas where the vegetation is little clear when water is visible when it comes to the dragonfly like this called as this is called as micro uh, pseudagrion species it is uh, pseudagrion malabaricum and multiple species of pseudagrion is found in uh, different type of elevations when it comes to pseudagrion species they are found on small uh, uh, grasses that is being around this small which small grasses and smaller vegetations around this around this water so it is found in this areas where is there is a lot of uh, grassy vegetation surface so that is that is the micro habitat condition that is the pseudagrion microcephala uses and when it comes to this rhyothermis variegata i mean triangularis this species are found on shrubs and small herbs on the sides of this ponds so these three species there will be multiple species that is using i just put three examples where you can see that when it takes a habitat itself these dragonfly they occupy different areas of the particular habitat so they are very particularly evolved to survive in very particular micro habitat conditions and when it takes away a paddy field this is another example i am going to give you this crocotherm servilla it is found in uh, this grasses and you can see sitting on this grasses on sunny whenever there's lot of sunshine you can see this rhyothem is very get a species which will be hovering around this over this grasses on on like uh, some 10 to 15 feet high from this grasses you can see this platylestes platystylus you can see them among, among the bushes and shrubs on the sides of this grass uh, sides of this uh, paddy field so they occupy different micro habitat conditions similarly when it comes to a fast flowing stream forest stream i mean slow stream or forest stream you can find this uh, heliocypha bisignata it is called a stream ruby for the beautiful color it has you can find it flying over this rocks and all small am i rocks and on the sides of the streams and uh, trithem is first the black stream glider carthumi this can be found on the either sides of this stream so they occupy different habitat when it comes to fast flowing streams you can find neurobasis chinensis which is actually flying around this fast flowing streams this way athle also you can find in this area uh, westalis apicalis on the sides of this bushes and all they can fly across the streams they are, actually these all are slow flyers they they cannot uh, they are not fast flyers the uh, flights uh, the they don't have a strong flight also so they adapted just to fly over this fast flowing streams and they lay uh, and when it comes to waterfalls you have saigonis iris like species which will be flying around this small waterfall area when it comes to shady streams you have Uh, protostricta gravelli and indostricta decanimsa there will be found on very shady areas in forest streams very tiny forest streams where the flow is not so high you can find them on the sides of this uh, shady areas in forest where light doesn't penetrate much so they uh, are adapted to this type of microhabitat condition and 
when you look at actual actually this is one of the example of what type of microhabitat condition as species is going to take this is a lyrotham is tricolor it breeds and it's seen around the small tree trunk cavities where it is filled with water so it's seen around this place so this is the microhabitat preference for this particular dragonfly and larger rivers you can find eurotham is signata flying around and also it it will be flying around across the rivers and this epithalamus vitata it will be flying through the uh, vertically over the sides of the streams epithalamus uh, so these two species are found in large rivers when it comes to reservoirs yes, you can find anax maculicum forms flying around the large reservoirs uh, hovering around and flying across the large on the around the water surfaces tritomis pallidavis can be seen flying uh, holding on to the stumps and others of where there's a lot of wind wind can be windy when it is windy it will, it will be actually found hanging on to some uh, small stems and all on the sides of this reservoirs and when it comes to it is salt tolerant waters on the coastal lagoons and all and estuaries can because these two species are little tolerant to salty conditions so you can find macrodiplax cora and motagrain virali these two species can be found seen on the sea shores and also on coastal lagoons and estuaries where water condition is little salty so this is there and this is the uh, foraging area i have been talking about but when it comes to egg laying you understand that odonate lays egg their eggs in water right so these oh, single different species of odonates they all prefer differ different oviposting site actually oviposting site is very different site they prefer to lay eggs so this you can see this is uh, a group of uh, river halidon or uh, i mean stream ruby uh, uh, species they this slide is in more Excuse me, sir. Slide is in now. Okay. Can you tell me which side are you viewing now? Which side are you seeing now? First two answer. The first no, one. No, just read, uh, read me the. Uh, heading of the slide. What slide? What is heading of the slide? You are reading now. For monetary ecosystem health. The first one. First, first slide. I can't do this. Okay. Uh, okay. Now second slide. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. 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 No. 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 Something is wrong. Wait. 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 Just hold on. The slide full slide view. Like uh, make it full slide view. Yeah, yeah, sir. That level, sir. Where am I? Let, let me check. Let me check. Okay. Okay. सर तो कौन गंदा सर फुल फुल स्लाइड शो स्लाइड शो आई लेट्स बी टेपर तो स्क्रीन नहीं किधर पहली स्लाइड है सर कौन है हाँ सेकंड स्लाइड है जने ऑल प्रोसेसिंग साइड प्रेफरेंस बट आधे ही स्लाइड में जब प्ले स्लाइड शो ले ले मेटे Sorry, seventeen slide. Ah, uh, seventeen slide. Yeah. Which one slide show on it, la? No, slide show on it.
Ο πλάζα. Πόνο σαρά.
We just tell them that they are here. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's unfortunate that this is the first time I'm been experiencing this. So I no idea how to rectify this also because. Ah, the board again. Matter under no. Ah, this one, this one. Wait, wait. Ah, channel just skip it and there because they are matching in the slides. But this is fine. So uh, we have been talking about. You just saw that. Ah, ah, we can mute it though. We can mute it though. Let me. We window mark for all of you guys. Are second there? Okay, slide show again. Okay, fine, fine. okay so uh, we uh, uh, for the last few slides you've been looking at what are the foraging sites that dragonfly uses so now you can see the ovi posting site ovi posting where the areas where that dragonfly love loves to lay their eggs so in this case also they are very preference very particular preference you can see the first one is the uh, uh, females of a spring lobby uh, eliosepa bicycna the spring lobby you can see they are uh, they are socially lay, uh, laying their eggs on the uh, sides of a stream When it comes to this species, you can see they are laying their eggs on uh, small twigs uh, that and uh, small vegetations uh, that is underlying in the water, submerged in the water. This is this uh, uh, Euphia despair, a species of torrent dart found north of Palakkad Gap. So this is laying their eggs, uh, penetrating the logs, uh, rotten logs on the sides of stream, and laying, inserting uh, small holes onto the logs and laying their eggs into the with the with the help of his ovi posture, just uh, inserting the eggs into these logs. This Another species of uh, dragonfly here, which lay, tries to lay eggs on the vegetation, which is uh, very much watery vegetation, which has nice good amount of water content in the, in the stems. It is laying the eggs in that, and uh, some other species are there which directly lay eggs into the water. We make next slide. We make next. Again. Okay. And uh, this is uh, preference or the ovi post. You saw what are the uh, micro habitat preference when it comes to foraging, and what are the micro habitat preference when it comes to egg laying. Now you can look at another uh, one thing the ordinate has is seasonality. Like butterflies, birds, and all, it has seasonality also. Here you can see that you have uh, uh, the two species are this. One of them is called as Rhyothomis lasigastra, and other one is called as Epithomis maria. When it comes to Rhyothomis arisa. This is in the month of June, actually, because they emerge out from the larval from early in the late May or early June, and they fly up to early July. There's hardly one month time when this dragonfly is seen flying in flight season. That is, the adult prong flying around is seen only in the month of June and in early July also. After that, all the adult prongs die off. They they are die off up before after laying eggs. So when they die off, the only uh, form of life this life of the sigastra is present on Earth is the form of egg. And after a few uh, months, the eggs hatch out into larvae, and then until the next June, the, uh, this dragonfly is in the water in the form of egg and larvae. So only it is seen flying around this in the month of June. So when you go to a Lyrothomis acigastra habitat, you will see them only in July, in, the, uh, in, the, in June month of June, and you note down how many species. You saw 60 numbers of acigastra in the month of June. If you come come the next year and see if you don't see a a uh, 60 number you know something has happened to this egg or larval form when they was in egg or larval form and that is uh, something to do with the uh, changes in the microhabitat condition so this is another indicator seasonality is also another indicator uh, by which a ordinates can be used as an indicator and this is another species called as epithomis maria this is similar to acigastra this dragonfly is found uh, active in the month of flight flying around in the month of august and september after that also the adult forms all die off then the The rest of the season, it is found as egg or larvae in the water. We take next slide. 
Next one, next one, next slide, next slide. Next, next, next. Okay. So this is another species. Uh, see, so that that is seasonality of a species. When it comes to pandala flowers, I know a lot of uh, them who spoke to the, this about you uh, in the last season might have explained to you well what is the speciality of this dragonfly. So as if its name suggests, they are globe skimmers or globe wanderers or wandering gliders. Wait, next slide. Uh, this important thing of the species is that they, uh, when you saw Lyrothomis asigastra and Epithomis maria, these Sujitha, sound is not Sound is Okay. Keka on. Keka on. Ah, keka. Okay. So, uh, uh, one of the particular thing of this dragonfly is that uh, um, when compared to Lerothemis sesigas and Epithemis maria, these hatch out within 38 to 40 days. Uh, when Because the other species, they require some 200 to 50 days to hatch out from a larval form to dragonfly. So, when a dragonfly lays eggs, it uh, uh, it hatches out into larval form and it goes to multiple maturation phases and then hatches out into adult. But when it comes to pandala flavescence like dragonfly, it just takes 38 to 40 days to hatch out from a uh, larva to adult form. Egg to larva to adult form, it just takes, the cycle takes. So another uh, interesting thing about that species of dragonflies is they travel along with the monsoon winds. They come to Kerala from Africa. From Kerala, they spread out through the Indian subcontinent to the northeast. And why? Uh, so, you know, the monsoon comes to Kerala in June and they come with the monsoon winds. They spread out to the Indian subcontinent and to the northeast. They come back to Kerala, of course, by October end. November, December, they'll be seen in large numbers all the uh, past. Then they go back to Africa from Kerala, coast. So, since they have to travel with monsoon, they are adapted to the short period of uh, cycle, short life cycle period. So, they cannot uh, wait for, and they can breed in temporary water pools and rains. So that is one of the interesting things. So this is the microhabitat preference and uh, the adaptation of the species to uh, the to travel along with this summer rains actually. We make next slide. So this is uh, this is why we launched a study. It'll study as as I said. So when you come to when you study the breeding biology and uh, other things of a species, you try to design a study for that. So this is one of the studies we designed called as Pan Pandala Track. The next slide. Pan Pandala Track is basically to track the migration of this dragonfly. When you track the migration of the dragonfly, you track the climatic condition, you track the uh, wind velocity, you track uh, uh, the numbers and which direction they go in, what is the habitat, what is the behavior they exhibit when, it, when you see the species. So it, you have, we have built up an online form which takes less than one minute where you can fill in the direction of which the dragonfly is moving, uh, the wind velocity at which the dragonfly is moving, what is the temperature at which the dragonfly is active, uh, other climatic condition and the numbers, what numbers are present and what is the activity they are doing then. These things can be drawn, uh, can be marked into a form within one minute because they are all drop-down menus and radio button forms. 
the next slide when you do such a documentation you get a figure you get a figure and you get this when you analysis this is you get an idea of how they migrate what is the weather conditions they migrate what all places they are, are they seeing what all numbers they are migrating at a point of time what is the uh, time at which they migrate from one place to another what was the climatic condition at that point so this is actually a map plotted when uh, we did this, did this study and this result was taken from our pilot study because this study has been long, going to be launched this year by june you will be all will be uh, getting this form uh, where you can fill and track this dragonfly which is seen in large numbers during the months of the august and all and when they come back to kerala after going back to north east will be seen in october and all so this study was basically uh, the pilot study was done in october and you can see that there's large record we have almost 780 records within one month of time and we didn't just get record from kerala coast but we also got records from northeast india from uzbekistan and from and also to, from africa also these people uh, entered data and sent us uh, sent us the data and we tried to analyze and we got an idea that not only the drag, uh, dragon flies are migrating from africa to india they are also migrating from africa to west africa also so this is a new idea which we got from such a study we take the next slide so uh, not only we did this uh, this is another study design which we started new in kerala we wanted to uh, we are we are designed this one to apply to all states and all sanctuaries because studies have been going off in different sanctuaries and this is one of the study we started the study in peria tiger reserve we started the study in 2017 uh, used to using the same protocol we did it 2018 and 2019 what was important thing of the study is that we had an uh, we had a opportunity to study this dragon flies prior to flight that is in 2017 after flights also in 2018 and 2019 so the next slide is going to show you the results of this study take the next slide so when you look at the study you can find uh, this uh, what all are seen in this uh, uh, blue color is the study results of 2017 uh, the red one is of 2018 and the in uh, yeah greenish one is of the 2019 the latest study after flights so prior flights when you look when you have two you have two species called as Eurobasis chinensis and uh, Heliocypha bicygnata. Heliocypha bicygnata was seen in a spring where we did transect study. One of our transect study was done. You see, thirty numbers in 2017. When it came to 2018, the number dropped to fifty. What happened in that time? I'll come to you. When you look at this new uh, another one, Eurobasis chinensis, twenty-seven numbers were seen in 2017. When it comes to 2018, this is ten, and again it is ten numbers. So the number is declined. What is happening? When a flood affects a stream, the microhabitat conditions of the stream is being changed, and you know that uh, dragonflies lay their eggs in different part of stream using different microhabitat conditions. So the larval form and egg form are washed out when a flood comes. So this is the uh, impact of 2018 floods to dragonflies. Their egg and larval form was washed down from the uh, uh, fast-flowing streams, and hence the number was decreasing. But one of the interesting thing was that we could identify that by 2020. the population is gradually becoming up back because these uh, conditions are these uh, these transects were laid inside forest areas which have been conserved areas so when since it is a conserved area the dragonfly had an opportunity to bounce back to because the it's uh, it is protected area hence the microhabitat conditions came back and along with the microhabitat condition the population of the dragonfly also emerged out they came out in the full number so when you do such study well designed study you get an idea what is going to happen to the population of dragonfly why is the number decreasing and you can look at the conditions what is the field condition has changed what is the micro change in microhabitat condition that brought back the changes in the population of the dragon this is how you take you, then when you if you can manage that microhabitat condition you can conserve the species of dragon fly also so this is how uh, faunal groups can be taken into conservation action plans next slide sir please so this is another seasonality study because since we don't have much time we'll i'll just see you can see there is population drops in multiple areas and Uh, when you see there is large drops in 2018 and 2017 and 2018 and they are dipping down in 2019 we can expect that is that is the indication of uh, what is happening to the dragonfly population also so this is a similar study we took up for kerala state biodiversity board in 2018 and 2019 actually after the flights called post flood impact assessment of faunal diversity so we wanted to know this uh, the government of kerala also wanted to know what is happening uh, to these faunal groups when a flood affects the country so Uh, this was uh, done with me vivek and balendra sir was part of the study because uh, actually though i uh, love to work on ordinates my prime uh, area of work is on uh, actually on frogs actually i do population genetics and molecular works on frogs so that study was been done 
So we took multiple faunal blocks for the study, and we were trying to identify. We were trying to do uh, study this transect area to see what is the changes the flood is, has made. What is the changes? Does has has any species gone extinct? Has any species number got reduced? Uh, has any population come down? So if I, if at all they come come down, what has happened to the microhabitat conditions by this flood that brought down the population of this for these uh, faunal groups? Actually, we take the next slide. So this uh, this was primarily done to see. What is the seasonality in this area? Has all as if I said to you, if you go to a particular area in March, you can see this is a population of dragonfly that should be present in this area. That is a particular microhabitat condition. You should see lot of in 60 numbers at, at that point of time. You should see uh, Epithemis maria in this numbers when it when it comes to August. So you can see if they, there's this population come up and then this much numbers after the flood. If they don't, you don't see this much numbers at that of point of time. You could know that. There is something has happened to the microhabitat, and that is why the population has come down. And you should try to intervene into the ecosystem, uh, make these much uh, efforts to conserve these things, these microhabitat, so that this particular dragonfly species is conserved. And along with that, all the uh, prey and predators of the species can be also conserved. Then the next next one. So this is the uh, study we did in Silent Valley National Park. Uh, 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 we did it in 2018 and 2019. Actually, we make the next slide. So this study was basically done in a, a buffer zone of uh, Silent Valley National Park in 2019. So we did a buffer zone study in this area. We identified some 90 species of dragonflies from this buffer zone. We identified the microhabitat conditions, what all microhabitat conditions was there, and how pristine these habitats were. And according to this, we submitted a report to the Silent Valley National Park. With this report, what they did is that if you could read, uh, there is a, a line uh, after uh, the heading which biodiversity. They purely state that this is the, this particular area is the emerging heaven for dragonflies and damselflies, and hence, since there is lower lot of large rare species of dragonflies here, it has to be protected. Because when you see lot of rare species of dragonflies in good numbers, it actually indicates, and you can write a report saying that. These much of rare dragonflies are seen in this much good numbers. That indicates that there are such good microhabitat and habitat conditions within these buffer areas, which requires protection. And that is how you use a, use a species to declare a protected area. So this is how a species goes into a species management plan or a park management plan, or helps in aid aids in uh, declaring a sanctuary or protected area. This is how it has been used. So you get an idea, better idea now how a species can be taken in park management plans. The next slide. So these are some uh, study reports that came up. It says climate change hits Silent Valley. How does it hit Silent Valley? Even the uh, local people were made aware that when these changes are seen in dragonflies, it indicates that these are the things as that has happened to the microhabitat. These are things that has happened to the habitat, and these needs to be conserved. The next slide, Vijay. And you know, when it comes to any species, uh, much of the threats that they have is all driven by human beings. We have overexploitation of resources. We take lot of waters. We overexploit overexploit waters. We pollute waters with uh, chemicals are there. And if, even if you take the condition of Brachytherium contaminata, if you contaminate a water with fertilizers and pesticides, that, that is not the actual contamination. Uh, because uh, if if the if a water is been contaminated by organ, uh, organic conditions, much of the larval forms can survive. But when it has been contaminated by chemicals and fertilizers, chemical contamination is there. Hardly any species can survive in such conditions. So we are doing large scale contamination of water resources with the help of pesticides, and this one no promotion of organic farming is done, which is difficult here. We modify flows of forest streams by building check dams and dams that uh, changes the microhabitat condition of this uh, fast flowing streams. Uh, there is a degradation of habitat is there large scale. We uh, we what we do is we actually uh, dump uh, wetlands with solid waste. We, Um, uh, put soil and convert wetlands to uh, areas where we can uh, build uh, such infrastructures and all. So these all things affects the dragonflies. And much of the studies when we did, we know that if you make a minor changes to this uh, habitats, there is change in their population. There is change in the number. Some species migrate off the from the areas. So as if uh, Pungat said in the last day, when you change a habitat, there will be migration of a species from the habitat to another habitat. And when a species migrates from one habitat to another habitat. It reaches the habitat of a topia and other species, and there will be competition, and this also will affect the population of this ordinate. When competition increases, also population is also come down. So, and another important thing that came up recently is that we have been introducing lot of invasive species knowingly or unknowingly. 
so this has uh, this has also large scale impact on the endemic species so these all threats play a major role in bringing down the population of ordinates and when the population of ordinates or the species number of ordinates come down it automatically impact, impacts the ecosystem and if this impact on ecosystem will in a large scale affect us all and we are yet to know what all impact is going to us uh, what all things are going to impact us because we we don't have much studies concentrated on what is going to happen if one particular faunal group disappears from this ecosystem we take the next slide uh, next slide i think we will skip this so these are uh, some of the useful uh, books and this one which is available in exosis website which has all developed as if uh, as if exosis has been into uh, webinars and classes for over the last few years last few months actually uh so these are all part of the awareness campaign because the prime first priority as if the first point is stated in this point first slide you should be aware of what all species are seen around you what all micro habitat and habitat conditions are being utilized by species what is the ecological role these species play in this ecosystem that is primarily important for conservation so the first step should be taken and even this uh, is webinar the conservation of ordinates is a step forward to impart knowledge on dragonflies and i hope uh, we uh, with this last few classes you have been uh, you had a good knowledge of dragonflies actually if you go to sos websites you can see you can download from the free books and all which are from you can learn about dragonflies and damselflies you can also join our facebook call called as dragonflies of kerala uh, which is our facebook group managed by society for ordinary studies you can raise questions there regarding the ecosystem or whatever it, role you are want to what all things you need to know about dragonflies you could also uh, uh, like put a species the photo of the species species the uh, experts are there much of like we have some 2500 members in the group which consists of one of the best experts in india so you can raise questions you can put photos you can get identified so it's an easier way because much of you use a social media platform so if you could put uh, figures or photos of dragonflies you get it identified you could ask about its habitat or micro habitat conditions experts will help you so we have a forum where you can interact with us easily and help you learn dragon flies we also have uh, another social media being called as kumbhi purana which are, which deals with instagram pages and facebook pages they promote this uh, dragon flies uh, conservation by which means of posters and other online medias so thank you everyone with the final side thank you everyone thank you i know uh, it has been uh, distracting because the webinar got some block effort and took 10 minutes in between so i don't know what happened actually uh, something went wrong uh, first time i experiencing it i unfortunately i could not troubleshoot that one also but still i think i i could have done justice to the topic of uh, i have to select to select by me thank you one and all for this uh, time and patience you uh, you gave thank you thank you sir thank you so much miss is there any doubts to be cleared Thank you, sir. I think this session is clear to everyone. I hope so. Thank you so much. I kindly welcome Ms. Sunita V. S. the guest lecturer, Department of Zoology, St. Joseph College for Women, Alappuzha, for the vote of thanks. Good evening, one and all. I will take it as a privilege to propose vote of thanks on this occasion. I extend. Sincere thanks to principals of both the college, SOS and Kerala Biodiversity Board. Also extend sincere thanks to organizing committee and coordinators. Then I extend a special heartfelt gratitude to resource person Dr. Vijay P. Gopal, who conducted a wonderful section regarding ordinate for. monitoring ecosystem i hope all of you are enlightened finally i extend sincere thanks to august participants 
once again thank you all thank you ma'am and thank you all for cooperating for such an informative session let's wind up for the time being and meet you tomorrow for another session brought up by dr m salahuddin assistant professor in zoology jamal mohammed college trichy to have a talk on the topic odonata conservation status and eco restoration once again thank you so much